So I, I have a pleasure of introducing a featured speaker, Professor uh, Ola Enquist uh, from AstraZeneca, one of the pioneers of uh, developing, most importantly, pragmatically using uh, AI and deep learning approaches in theoretical and experimental drug discovery. Uh, Ola received his PhD at, uh, from Lund University and then was a postdoc at Cambridge. Uh, he joined AstraZeneca in 2004, uh, where he currently is the lead of the molecular AI department. Uh, I think a very uncommon yet, but to be common, name for uh, academic and uh, industrial departments. Uh, he is well known for what he has been developing in the area of AI, uh, interest in molecular de novo design, synthetic root prediction, large-scale molecular property prediction, over 100 peer-reviewed publications. He is also an adjunct professor in machine learning and AI for drug design at Chalmers University of Technology and trustee of Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. This is what he says about himself in uh, the AstraZeneca website. I'm fascinated by applying the latest AI and machine learning technologies to drug discovery, it has the potential, together with further progress in automation, to transform the drug discovery process. Ola, please take us on the trip with you. Okay, thanks a lot and thanks for the kind words. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad I make it in the end. So unfortunately, I've only been here two days. So if you'd like to chat with me, we do try to do it over lunch. I will be available, but then I will go back again. Okay, so my name is Ulen Chris. I've been at AstraZeneca for quite a few years now. And I'm honored to lead a department called Molecular AI, where we basically try to develop new methods uh, for applying machine learning AI for drug design, productionalize the methods, then apply it to our product portfolio, basically not only in Gaffin, but, but to all our sites. And I'm part of what's called Discovery Science, as I sit in Discovery Science Leadership Team, which is the global function for all basically drug discovery technologies within AstraZeneca globally. So we are around nine, 900 people in total. Uh, I don't, maybe I don't need to show this slide nowadays because uh, just to explain what we are doing. So we are basically developing new medicines both creating value for the patients and for the society. Uh, since you might not be that used to pharmaceutical companies, so just have some numbers here to, to basically explain the size of what we are talking about. So, so basically our revenues are almost $40 billion since 2021. Uh, we invest $10 billion in R&D. Now, of course, it's much more D than R because a lot of the investment goes into the clinical pipeline, but there's a significant investment also in the research. Uh, our main uh, area of, so to say, where we did the discover and develop drugs on oncology, cardiovascular, renal, metabolism, respiratory immunology, and also now we, uh, through acquisition of Alexi, we also work in rare diseases. And in total, I, Around now, we are around 83,000 employees. And the, basically, the strategic priorities is for the, department, for the company, and like, so the same for my department, is free. For my department, is uh, the deliver impact on the project portfolio uh, and accelerate innovative science. How can we push science further? And from, in my case, it's applying machine learning AI. Of course, what's very important for us is that we really a great place to work for everybody can thrive and develop. Uh, so to say, we are all over the world, but the research is have three main sites. One is in the US in Gaffersburg. This is our center for large molecules or antibodies, and, and two centers in Europe. One in Cambridge, which is uh, newly open, where they focus on oncology research. And the other one is over in Gaffenburg in Sweden, where I'm located, where we focus on cardiovascular and respiratory research. Uh, this is the site where I'm working, Gaffenburg. Just to point out that we, are, we do basically everything from target identification all the way up to launch. We have 2,800 employees in Gaffenburg from over 70 countries and over 600 PhDs. So it's a, it's, 
uh, I think at least in Europe, one of the biggest research sites. Uh, and this is um, to illustrate that I'm, now I will talk about drug discovery, but actually that's only quite a tiny part of the whole journey uh, for our medication. To start with drug discovery, uh, then you find a preclinical candidate, you do all the necessary studies, so you can start, start your phase one study, and after phase one, so you basically make sure which dosing you should have and that it's safe. You take it into phase two, where you check the efficacy or, uh, so say, measure the efficacy, how much impact you have on the patients, so hopefully in a good way. And then you have phase three, where you more look for unusual side effects. You have a much uh, bigger cohort of patients there. And then you have the regulatory part and the submission launch and then post launch uh, activities. So it's, uh, it's a long process that probably usually take around 10 years from your start on a new uh, target until you actually launch the drug. Uh, and what has happened a lot in the last years, not only at Asta, but I think at all companies, uh, not only in pharma, but in also in other sector, that data science and AI have become much more important. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something that we really try to apply from the early parts of drug discovery and all the way up to launch and manufacturing. Uh, so if you look at the drug discovery and development, so uh, some examples where we use machine learning AI is in target identification, we use a technique called knowledge graph where we collect all data that exists, the text mining and also uh, from and yeah, various other sources. Uh, and, and then we build a big graph and then we to basically try to discover new connection that could indicate a new potential target for one of our key indications. We apply it in drug design, which I will come back to. Of course, we apply it in toxicology. So say, how can we reduce the number of animals we need to use in our safety studies and so on. A quick win is in imaging, both in preclinical imaging as well as in clinical imaging. How can we basically classify the images much quicker with machine learning AI? And then also we start to apply it in, in the clinical studies. How can we, through text mining, actually identify our patient cohorts quicker? Uh, but going back to drug design, uh, and in drug design, in the end, we only want to answer two questions. Uh, which compound to make next in a project and how to make it? Uh, it might sound easy, but of course, the devil is in the detail in the end. It's many times very complex to, to, to basically to understand which is the best compound to make next. Uh, and uh, how you approach a small molecule drug discovery project in the industry is actually pretty standard. You have what we call a design, make, test, analyze cycle. Uh, so you have a starting point, you have a hit, a use it's weakly active, uh, it can come from high throughput screening, which is historically been the main source. Uh, you can use DNA encoded library screening, you can use fragment-based screening, or you can use knowledge-based method like virtual screening. So you get a starting point. It's usually weakly active, it could be toxic, so it has a lot of liabilities. And then you iteratively optimize your compound. Uh, so hopefully in the end, you have a candidate drug uh, that is then high potent, efficacious, uh, that is no less safety liabilities and so on. And I put a number, three years, uh, which is probably could be a median number, but the variation is very big both dependent by what is your actually starting point uh, and, and also which is your indication. Uh, and of course, you would like to speed up this with uh, AI. And in the end, you can do it in two ways. Uh, you can try to reduce the number of cycles by predicting better compound in each cycle. So you can come to the goal quicker. That's one way. And the second way is you increase the speed of each cycle, either through basically using AI to predict the best synthetic route or using AI together with chemistry automation to synthesize your compounds much quicker than you would do manually. Uh, 
And I usually also always have this slide. Uh, why no? Because I, as you can see, I've been around for a while in, in the field and uh, led, led a team for quite an, a number of years. So we were quite small for a long time. We did more or less the same thing. We used apply the standard techniques like docking and similarity search and so on. And it was good. But then suddenly something shifted and around five years ago or so. And, and why, why did it shift? I think one really important aspect is the increased computational power. I think the GPU has, uh, so to say, kind of transformed both machine learning, just as it's tra transformed gaming and so on. Uh, and the increased computational power has led to a tipping point in which type of applications you can do. Uh, the, the second is the advancement in algorithms. And I think in drug design, I think we've been pretty good at picking up progress in other areas uh, like uh, image recognition, natural language processing, and we come back to that, or, or playing Go. And of course, and then there's also a very, so to say, good environment for innovation. There's a lot of open source software. So basically anyone can start to, to play around, learn the method and start to develop new methods. There's a whole environment and ecosystem of open source software. So you have all the kits for chem informatics, you have scikit learn for more standard machine learning. You have PyTorch and TensorFlow for, for deep learning. And of course, since that's it's all open source, it's everybody can actually work and, and push the borders and move forward. Uh, going back to uh, natural lang language processing and why that those methods are very important. I think probably internally, this is the methods that's been most important. Is basically, you can describe a molecule in different way, uh, like a graph, which is very intuitive. Uh, but you can also describe it like a smile screen. And here we have color coded, say which letter in the smile string corresponds to which atom in the graph. And a smile string is, of course, it is a compressed format, which it, it is good. It's been broken computers. Uh, it's also language in its own right, in its own grammar, which means basically we can use a, a lot of the algorithms developed for natural language processing more or less off the shelf to. Uh, on uh, to chem informatics so on our problems for drug design. So basically, you can see uh, synthesis prediction as a language translation from the reactants to the products. Uh, you can see also see molecular optimization where you do a small change to the molecule as a language translation from a starting molecule to a final molecule. And you can see basically text generation you can use the same principle to generate smile string to sample the chemical space. So that there is a lot of algorithms that we can use for natural language processing and that have helped us a lot. Just to give an overview, so this is some personal thoughts where I think uh, where we are ourselves via the AI-based drug design. So I will go come back and talk quite a bit about deep learning based models at the no generation because I think actually they are the best or most progress have made. Uh, so we had, there's been a lot of algorithms developed by us, but a lot of also other groups, how you can navigate the chemical space. And it's not a solved problem, but it's fair. I don't think it's really a bottleneck anymore. So you can sample the chemical space fairly well. But what is still a problem many times is to score the molecules, uh, to basically to uh, get an accurate value, are they actually soluble, in particular, are they actually selective, the generated molecules, or are they actually potent in the primary target? So there's definitely much more to do to, to improve the scoring function. A synthetic root prediction, I think there's been a lot of progress there. I think, I guess Connor is not here. I think he was giving a talk earlier, and of course he has been one of the pioneers. He, in that field. MIT has done a lot of work and also IBM have done a lot of work. And there have been a lot of new powerful algorithms developed. Uh, I would say there probably you have hit a plateau. Uh, so I think you can 
you can get more or less as far as you can with the data you have. To get much better, I think you need to generate data from scratch. And I think that's not a true only here, but I think some other fields as well. So you basically need to have controlled conditions. Uh, you need to have, in particular, both positive and negative examples. If you build models on, on literature data, that's mainly only positive examples because you only report something that is actually working. Uh, so I think it's together with automation, you can actually generate much more data in the future. So I think the modeling there has a really bright future. Uh, and then you have molecular property prediction. And there I would say the number of methods existing has really exploded. Uh, you can you have much more flexibility now with deep learning. I think if there really there have been much progress in accuracy, I think it's uh, more debatable, at least in, in the prospective competitions like the sample competition, the limited draggable genome competitions, there have not been that much uh, progress in, in the last few years with the new methods. So you, you, you have more alternative, but I don't think necessarily your model will be much better. I think we have seen some improvement, particularly for very big data set and multi-graph convolutional network, but in, in other, so to say, for other data sets, it's more or less the same you get the random forest or support vectors. Uh, of course, what has happened is uh, 3D plotting prediction. Uh, there had, for sure, there have been stunning progress with AlphaFold2 uh, making a very big jump in accuracy. And I think that's, that's really an important uh, breakthrough. Uh, to have impact on drug discovery, I think it's much more, and it's important as well to include the dynamics. Uh, usually most uh, protein and PDE that is built on doesn't have a ligand, and that's reflected in the structures from alpha pole 2 so they're not necessarily suitable to do docking uh, and so on. But there's a lot of work going on around that, so I'm sure there will be more progress. Uh, I think if you have time, I will also come back to, to say it's not about only about machine learning and AI. It's very important that it's, it's much more needed. You, you need to have a vision also around how you actually generate new data sets through high throughput data generation. You, you use automation. And I think also an important aspect, it's a very important research field. There might be, have been some talk, is basically how you merge machine learning, AI, and physics-based modeling, like molecular dynamic simulation, use AI machine learning to improve the force field, or basically to, to speed up the simulation. So I think that is a uh, field that a lot of things will happen in the coming year, and of course, there's a lot of investment as well. Of course, it's, we're all human, so the culture is very important. So it's important to have a culture where you, what we call AI first, that you think about the AI the whole time, both when you plan the project, you generate the data and you analyze the data. So it's important that data science in the AI is, is part of your culture. And then of course, things are moving forward very quickly. So you need continuous training of uh, and education of the staff. Just going back one slide, a little bit so uh, neural network and deep learning have been around for very many years now uh, and it has its ups and downs uh, during those times actually when i started in the industry 2000 they were quite a popular uh, you had a let's say a neural network with one hidden layer and an input layer and an output layer and then you use that for solubility prediction so on property prediction and it works fairly well but then Random forest and the support vector machine came, and they usually performed a little bit better. Uh, so then, neural network kind of disappeared for very many years, so at least a few does. And then they came back uh, maybe around 2014, 15. And then, due to more computational power, you could have much more uh, advanced, uh, let's say, 
architecture. And I think that's really the, the view we did learn. It's not one architecture. It's very many architectures. You, you can really, for the say, construct very advanced architecture that is really suitable for your project. Uh, one is to support the field for a neural network with several hidden layers. And uh, one is a network that would be very impactful for us, as we must call uh, uh, RNNs, the current neural networks, uh, but where you have information, not only flows from the input layer to the hidden layer and to the output layer, but you have the information also flowing sideways. Uh, and that's very interesting if you work with strings uh, or actually time dependent fit phenomena, then you can actually learn what happens in a string or in a sentence. And that's something you, you can really take advantage of. This is just a slide to say what we're interested in. So, so historically, and we still do, uh, we, we do enumeration of chemical libraries. Uh, and then you can do, you can do quite a few compounds when you think about it. Maybe you can do a billion compound or 10 billion compounds. But the problem is, irrespectively, how much you, you enumerate, you will never come much bigger because of the, the space restriction. And it will still be an extremely tiny part of the chemical space. I think for us, when we're working with, as I say, chemical information, what we would like to tell the project, we, we can actually sample the chemical space to find potentially not all, but very many different alternatives for new scaffolds and so on. So therefore, uh, generative models are very important because then you, you train a neural network and then basically you can sample the whole chemical space. Now I will not go into our papers that we basically show that, but uh, if you search on Google Scholar, I had a very talented PhD student together with Jean-Louis Raymond in, in Switzerland. So we benchmark RNNs for the GDB databases, which have uh, been developed by the Raymond lab. And we could basically show that if you train on a very tiny part of GDB, we could basically reproduce the whole database. Uh, so, so it, it actually works very nicely. Not probably all type of architecture works like that, but uh, well, neural network does. And for us, the, the two most important architectures uh, for Adenova design is, is basically, it's depending on what we would like to do. A few times in the project, you would like to dump somewhere else. Uh, could be that you're not happy with your scaffold. Uh, it has some inherent liability. It can be metabolic, unstable or something like that. Uh, and uh, you, you would like to find a starting point that is quite different from what you know. You can also want to have, might want to have several alternatives because before you, you have profiled your compound in a in an animal model, you don't really know what will be working. So, so for that, we use recurrent neural networks, and I will come back to that. I'll, uh, I'll go into detail. And for optimization, we have now converged to uh, a transformer architecture. I will not go into the details there. It's, it's a kind of complicated architecture. I'm not really sure if I understand it myself, but I have some team members that understand it. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's transformer is of course a GPT-3 in product and so on. And it has performed state of the art in language translation. And since actually optimization is a language translation, at least in our hands, uh, we have published that uh, as well. We compare the transformer to seek to seek to graph to graph and so on. This, this is basically that uh, algorithm, at least in our hands, the sample, the close chemical space well, where you want to optimize the compound. Going back to RNN, so this is just an example that we use actually recurrent in our network more or less every day. Uh, we, we, we have our we text, we, we send our SMS, and then you always get a suggestion for your next word. And that's usually based on a recurrent in our network that we train on a corpora. So there's a probability always what your next word will be. And of course, that can be also translated to uh, chemistry. So, so if you train a text corpora, 
uh, and then you have a sentence, the grass is, then the RNN will give probability what the next word would be. So there's a, it's very much more higher probability the grass is green but than the grass is purple, for instance. Uh, so, so basically, when you are in a sentence, there's a conditional probability, what will be the next word in your sentence? And that can then be translated to uh, chemistry. So if you have a compound, uh, first a carbon, then a carbon, then a dub double bond, uh, and then it's very likely that the next atom will be an oxygen. Uh, because uh, acetaldehyde is a very common chemical. So, that principle we can actually use to sample the chemical space. Just a slide how we do it in practice. So, so basically, for all our RNN, this was started out with TensorFlow, but uh, I think everyone has now swapped to PyTorch. We use PyTorch and then we describe the molecules not in smiles but in one hot encoding that we feed into the, the recurrent neural networks. And here's uh, illustration i hope it will work so basically you have trained your recurrent neural network to a set of molecules could be say for instance campbell the train will be smiles uh, and then you want to generate molecules and you do that by basically sample smile strings and uh, in the rnn say for each character you have a probability distribution so so here's the probability distribution for the first character so the most common is an aliphatic carbon. Uh, so the, the level of greenness indicates the probability. This is most probable. The second most probable is an aliphatic oxygen. And the third is uh, uh, an aliphatic nitrogen. And then let's see which it chooses this time. Uh, it selects, selected the second most common, the oxygen. So it's sample from distribution. So it must always take the most probable. So you have the oxygen. Uh, and then it will, uh, so to say, it will display a molecule to the right. You can see it put an oxygen there. Uh, and then you have the conditional probability. So if you select the first one as oxygen, then you have a conditional probability. What will the next character in the string be? And you can see the conditional probabilities here. Uh, and then you have a very dark green square up there, and that's for an equal sign. And that's because the carbonyl group is a very common motive in a, in a drug-like molecule, uh, but it can, in theory, select something different. To select, uh, say, an aliphatic carbon, which corresponds to uh, an alcohol. And so let's see what it select. It indeed selected double bond, and now it will select through the conditional probabilities character after character in the smiles, and to the right it will be build up a drug-like molecule. So this is basically what happens when you sample an RNN to generate new molecule. Of course, of course, this is a slow motion, but this is what it happens. And and it, it's the, uh, so, so I think this, when I saw this for the first time, probably have been the most input, impactful moment in, in, in my career. It was Actually, some of you might know the name Marvin Segler. So he was an unknown PhD student in the autumn of uh, autumn winter 2016. Uh, but we met him at the conference, and then he came as a guest to Astra, and he showed his main project, which was the synthesis prediction work that led to his Nature article. And this was actually his uh, a side project he has. And we did a joint article together with him, and then we, we started to apply it internally. And what was then important for us, because we have solved half the, the problem uh, by the generation, and then we need to solve the second half, is actually uh, how, how do you optimize your molecule? Because now you can sample the space, but you need to hone in on the right part of the chemical space. And how do you do that? And there we apply a technique called reinforcement learning. So basically, uh, you each molecule that's generated is scored, and that score changes the RNN. If it has a good score, it increases the weight to generate more similar molecules. And we have a short video here that we would like to generate similar compounds to silicoxib. Not exactly the copy we could have done, but with similar compounds. And then it first searches, 
more or less randomly in the chemical space. It doesn't find anything. But then suddenly it starts uh, by pure chance to find a molecule that is actually it's similar to silico -xib. And then for reinforcement learning, you learn how to generate more and more similar molecules. And then you come up to a similarity coefficient of 0 0.7, uh, uh, as you said, as criteria. Uh, and uh, so that's basically how, how we uh, you generate molecules uh, and uh, and that's part of a paper as well. It was the first original reinvent paper that we published in uh, 2017, which I think also was the first actually open source version of a de novo generation tool that people could use. Uh, and now it has been superseded with a new version, but, it, but it's still around. Uh, and uh, actually a lot of people are still using it. Uh, but of course, reinforcement learning is very powerful, but you need to be careful uh, because if you have a problem with a scoring function, there's a hole in your scoring function where the method get, so to say, the method gives unrealistic positive value, you can always find the, the hole. So it's very good actually to check your QSR model or anything so you don't have any area where the chemical space where it doesn't predict well. That's one thing. And then, of course, um, it's, it learns to find one minima, but then it will stay there, it will not move on. Uh, so, so basically what we do there, we do a scaffold penalty. Uh, uh, so so we, we add a penalty, so we make sure that we get a diverse set of uh, uh, scaffolds. So that was implemented by uh, Thomas Blaschke, uh, another big chem student. So we were part of a EU project uh, with things, I think, was it? 2017 to 2020, something like that. As we had some brilliant students, so I mentioned Joseph before. This this work was done by Thomas Blaske, together with Jürgen Bayerat. Um, and then we had a bit. I think the key to have uptake internally uh, was basically when we coupled together with docking. First, had we only could score with QSCR model. We had some impact we, we made our first lead optimization investment decision ai based molecule but it was still quite a few only a few projects and then since most in practice now most drug discovery projects are structural enabled because you not only have extra crystallography nowadays you also have cryo em so you can basically crystallize every target and uh, so then we coupled into the reinforcement learning uh, also docking uh, program and, so say we have the platform reinvent, uh, but so and that's open source, so you can download and play around if you want. Uh, and then the philosophy that we also can include both other open source or the commercial tools. So for docking, we implemented in the end five engines: uh, Gold, uh, uh, Schrödinger, and OpenAI's commercial, then Autodoc and Ardoc as. Uh, uh, open source and now it's, it's out in general chemioinformatics uh, and that was actually the I think the most important part to get uptake internally uh, basically when we include structure based scoring uh, and then of course we now have free energy perturbation scoring as well but in the post processing okay how much time do I have okay I only have five minutes okay <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let's see, should we jump over? Uh, uh, I think this is just a, a quite a important slide uh, that uh, we really emphasize that it's not only about uh, uh, the, the machine and the AI, it's, it's not around which data do you generate. Uh, and I think for, for chemistry, I think there's a lot of progress both in robotics and purification, so high throughput experimentation, uh, so for optimization of chemical reaction is getting more standard, uh, actually both in, in pharma, but also in, uh, in, in academia. Uh, and there's a lot of regeneration, there's a lot of very interesting technology, how you can create biological fingerprints of the molecules. Uh, I think the one that's just come first is full of cell paint fingerprints. So you, basically you can now screen a big part of your collection uh, in a cell paint assay and then you get like a biological signature 
biological fingerprint for each molecule that will be complementary to your structural fingerprint. And for the cell paint, I don't have a slide about that, uh, but uh, we are part and nine other pharma companies are part in a big collaboration with the Broad Institute. So we will release in the public domain, I think in November this year, a set, I think it's to be 150,000 compounds, the structure and the, the cell paint uh, uh, signatures and actually the raw images as well. People would like to use that. And then it's basically to encourage uh, open innovation and uh, new methods how to use these uh, fingerprints. Uh, and then uh, automation, because if you have AI without automation, you kind of speed up the, the, the thought process so you can have more alternatives. But the synthesis will probably take the same time. Uh, so it's important as well that uh, you do public with automation, both uh, chemistry automation, but also cross testing. I'm not a big fan of this closed loop system where you actually send around everything through a flow system. I think that's it's a little bit unflexible, but probably it would be more like a batch system with robots moving between different stations. But I think that's that's necessary. And then combine AI with physics. I mentioned before. I think that that's really a key point. I will only show. I will jump over the slides, but uh, uh, you can have the slides. Uh, so I think here, what does success look like? Of course, I have got quite a few investment in the team, quite a few new members of the team. So my boss and particularly my boss, boss, the head of research, asked what, what has he got for the money? Uh, and I think from, for me, it's what is important is then how do we define success? Uh, of course, we have metrics like uh, uh, time savings that we should reach clinical candidates quicker with applying machine learning, AI, and, uh, and without using it. And we, we do see our uh, clinical pipeline slowly being populated by uh, molecules which have been impacted by machine learning AI. But I think that's that's more the, the result of success than the success itself. I mean, what I and we really would like to come is around the trust, that you, you trust uh, the AI in the same way that you trust uh, that they use X-ray crystal structures. Uh, and, uh, for poor, poor design. And that means two things, basically. Both that you trust uh, in the prediction of uh, the individual molecules, that basically trust the predicted properties uh, and the predicted the synthetic root. But it's also that there's a trust that if you apply AI consistently in a project, you will come to the end, let's say the, the end goal, the clinical candidate, quicker and more, effi more efficiently than you would do without uh, uh, basically applying machine learning AI. Uh, this is just showing some of our publications. So do, if you're interested in what I'm talking about, do go to our GitHub account. There, there's a, basically the code for all papers. I promised Igor Tetko that I was going to make advertisement. We have another, uh, uh, so to say, PhD student program going on at the moment called AID, and there's a lot of online courses in school that is possible to attend for everyone. So you're, you're definitely welcome to, to attend over Zoom there. Uh, and also, say, if you're finishing your uh, PhD soon, we will have free postdoc uh, position coming out uh, in Assassinate in Gaffenburg within the next month, one in my team working on the transformers I just described, and two others around uh, modeling RNA, small molecule interaction. And that's, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and of course, happy to take questions, either now or during lunch. Well, thank you for the very comprehensive and exciting lecture, and of course, everyone is wondering what you didn't show. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have time to show, but, yeah. but thank you for promise to share yeah. the slides. Questions, please. Uh, thank you for such an inspiring um, talk about artificial intelligence. And I really liked your comparison uh, that we should trust AI as we trust X-ray structures, but we designed X-ray structures, all limit models by ourselves. We can interpret them. Yeah. 
But when we can trust and interpret that and have a reliable artificial intelligence models, when the time will come for that? How do you think? You, you mean that, that trust? I think, it's, I think it will be very much field dependent. Uh, I, I think for us, if you look at drug design, I think it, it's, you need to be a bit better with the predictions. Uh, FAP, F, F, I think the estimation works well in some cases, but not all, it's still in all cases. So you need to be, it needs to work more at maybe 90% of the cases, then you will trust it. I, I think with, um, uh, I think uncertainty quantification is very important. I think much less have gone into uncertainty quantification than it should have been. Uh, and I think it's, you more, doesn't need to be accurate based on the online data if you can still have a calibrated uncertainty quantification that is 80% likely. Uh, and I think, but some like in vivo uh, prediction directly from structures, I don't think they ever be. It, it's simply too complex problem. It's, it's very expensive to generate data. The data is very variable, and you try to model a very complex surface. So, so that there will always be limitations. So it's, it's it'll be context dependent. I shall say, as the next person asked the question, I think you're proposing to establish a new church of AI ontology. Thank you very much for a very visionary and strategic talk, and along the strategic lines. So there is a new revolution coming in the next probably five years with quantum computing. And there is a growing consensus that quantum supremacy will be shown in chemistry rather than blockchain or code breaking. So how do you think or how do you plan to incorporate quantum computing into drug discovery? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to sound cynical, but the quantum, quantum computing has been the next technology for quite a while now, and it still needs to actually do the breakthrough. I mean, but we are looking into it. Uh, it's not so done by, by my team. It's more done by a similar team to uh, mine that's working in pharmaceutical development. Because we think, I mean, one area uh, where quantum computing would first have impact is diagonalization of large matrices. And, and then you need that for accurate quantum chemical calculations, basically. Uh, and it's more when you want to predict the, the crystal structure of a compound because you, you pattern that as well so it's it's more that team that is the, let's say the front runner looking into quantum uh, quantum technologies but we, we, we do look into it and uh, actually we're very lucky Gaffenberg but the Wallenberg Foundation is also building a quantum computer so it's on the it's on the horizon yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for interesting talk. Um, I just had a question about the cell painting. So that's definitely, I think, a cool project. I also like to work on this. And my question was, how would you do, how, what can, do you also have like um, annotations for this? Because biological similarities may be a little bit difficult if you don't have a lot of data for a lot of labels for this. And another short question is maybe also, what kind of agent and framework are you using for your reinforcement learning? Uh, we're not using reinforcement like for the cell paint. Yeah. Uh, no, no, for, for that, I mean, uh, it's, you need to look at the article. I have, have it somewhere, but it's, it's, it's a standard reinforcement learning algorithm. So, I mean, for, for, for cell paint, I, I think there it's a, it's a lot. You don't need that much data because many times what you do is you want to compare the signature of your molecule with the signature of, uh, for genetic knockout, overexpression, to see if you see similarity uh, and, and so on to do what you understand the biology. Okay, last question, Sasha. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. So uh, as far as I know, uh, AstraZeneca pioneers in the field of uh, robotics. So to your opinion, how far uh, we are from fully automatized drug design without any human intervention? I mean, the, 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 there is, that's, that's two things there. I mean, first, uh, the brain, but also the dexterity. Uh, and I think that's challenges in both. Um, I mean, robotics is good at some things, but not good at, say, acid development yet. Uh, it's also challenging if you want to do on a robotic platform a multi-step reaction with intermediate purification. 
Uh, one step reaction is perfectly fine, LIBOR is perfectly fine, but multi step reaction, we need immediate purification and do that well for a large variety of reaction is still a challenge. So, so there is still there's, the, the lab challenge still for the fully automated. And of course, then you have the brain challenge as well. Uh, and <laughs> uh, that is something we, we, that can be discussed a lot. Uh, and I'm actually working with, with, with that. Uh, we, we have a collaboration. Uh, with Professor Sami Kaski at the Alp University in Finland uh, to start to model that, the human in the loop and, and so on. We, we are clearly not there, uh, but how long time it would be take before, say, you have an AI that has an equally surprising molecule uh, that works, that say that the AlphaGo doesn't go. It's, uh, I don't know, but I'm sure that they will probably come, but I don't know when. <laughs> will be automated labs filled with graduate students. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for wonderful